Uh, welcome everyone and thank you for joining us for today's webinar. My name is Erin Levy. I am the Head of Research and Investor Strategy at Datamaran. I'm filling in for my colleague Suzanne Cadis today who is unfortunately unable to join us. Uh, but today we're going to dive into the role that stock exchanges play in driving the demand for more transparency on non-financial issues and consider how the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, or SDGs, can be used as a vehicle to do so worldwide. So first up, we're going to hear views from today's expert panelists, and then we'll open up the Q&A with all of you. Everyone is muted for the duration of the webinar to ensure audio quality, but we do want to hear from you throughout the webinar. So you can share your questions and comments through the chat box and we'll monitor this throughout and address your questions at the final 20 minutes. We also welcome you to engage in a conversation on social media. We'll be sharing highlights using the following hashtags on Twitter. You can see on the screen in the top corner, as well as the individual hashtags of our panelists. Um, so before we dive into the content, I'm delighted to introduce today's panelists. Uh, first up, we have Sonia Favoretto, B3's Media Relations, Sustainability and Communications Managing Director, as well as the Associate Director of B3's Institute and the Chair of the Governance Committee of the Corporate Sustainability Index. Outside of B3, Sonia is the Vice President of the UN Global Compact Brazilian Committee, member of the advisory committees of the Global Reporting Initiative for Brazil and CDP's Driving Sustainable Economies. She's also a member of the Communication and Institutional Relations Permanent Committee of the Brazilian Women Leaders Network for Sustainability. Hi, Sonia. How are you today? I'm very well, Irene. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thanks. Um, next up, we have Siobhan Cleary. Head of Policy and Research at the World Federation of Exchanges. In this role, she coordinates the work of the WFA membership in areas of sustainability, emerging markets and SME, and also drives research in these areas. Prior to this, Siobhan conducted research on stock exchanges and sustainability for the UNEPFI inquiry into the design of a sustainable financial system and was Director of Strategy and Public Policy at the Johannesburg Stock Exchange. And she's joining us from South Africa today. How are you, Siobhan? Hi, Erin. Hi, everyone. Good, thank you. Great. Uh, and lastly, we have Rebecca Self. She's the Chief Financial Officer of Sustainable Finance at HSBC. In this role, Rebecca is responsible for the worldwide financials relating to sustainable finance products. This includes sustainability green bonds, environment social governance asset management funds, and sustainability related commercial lending. In addition, Rebecca is responsible for HSBC's ESG reporting and investor relations activity, including the task force on climate related financial disclosures. Rebecca is a senior finance business partner to HSBC's corporate sustainability function. How are you, Rebecca? Very well, thank you. Welcome everyone. Perfect. Fantastic to have you all joining us today. Um, so this is the third in a series of webinars that Data Marine is hosting on the SDGs. Uh, today's webinar is also hosted as part of the Trans-European Social Innovation and Inclusion of the SDGs project in which Data Marine is participating alongside seven other partners that you see on the screen. Uh, and you can read more about this project on our website if you're interested. So a big reason why we're here today is to reflect on the rapidly changing landscape around non-financial issues, those on which the SDGs focus. The demand for more and better quality information on non-financial issues is increasing at an exponential speed. To help contextualize today's conversation, what we see on the screen now is that um, a huge evolution in the amount of regulatory reporting requirements, uh, 20 times the amount that there were even four years ago. Stock exchanges are one of the key stakeholders that are helping to derive this demand in the form of listing requirements and recommendations. And that is exactly what we're going to focus on today. So in today's discussion, we're focusing on three key questions. Why are stock exchanges implementing non-financial reporting? 
do the UN SDGs present an opportunity to close the information gap between corporates and investors? And how can technology help to enable the closing of this gap? So before we start, we want to hear from the audience. We actually have three polls in today's webinar. And for the first one, we're wondering, um, yeah, is your company currently reporting publicly on the SDGs? So there's a pop-up window that you should see. Um, you can respond to the poll through the pop-up. Once you respond, um, close your screen, which will give us the answer. Um, we'll see the, um, what those are at the, the end of the presentation. And actually we have a huge number of response coming in already, um, which is fantastic. We're getting really close. Oh, uh, interesting. With a couple more seconds to answer that. And actually we're seeing that pretty large proportion of companies are not reporting on the SDGs yet. Um, so you should see the results on your screen, which is probably not surprising, I guess, um, given that they're you know, a fairly new set of guidances. Um, and hopefully that's part of the reason why you're here, is to learn a bit more about that. So I'm going to jump in straight away to get some of the, uh, the answers to those questions. Um, and yeah, I'd like to start with Sonia, our first speaker, um, talking about the role of stock exchanges. Hi, Sonia, how are you? Hi, Ari, I'm very well. Thank you so much. Um, first, I would like to thank you uh, and Susie from the Tamaran for this kind invitation, and also Rebecca and Shoban for sharing the panel, and of course, for all the participants listening. It's a great pleasure to be here today to share our experience on SDGs and transparency. So uh, let's go for the first slide, please. Yeah, um, I will talk about this initiative report to explain for SDGs that we launched this year. But before I would like to, to talk a little bit about B3. In this slide, you can see some figures and information about B3. B3 is a result of a merger uh, that we had in this year uh, between BMNF Bovespa, the Brazilian Stock Exchange, and CTP. And since the April this year, we are B3, a new company. So B3 is one of the world's largest financial market infrastructure providers in market value. We are based in Sao Paulo, and we have offices in Shanghai, London, and New York. On the right side of this slide, you see what we believe uh, is our key role in sustainable development. Um, you know that uh, a stock exchange exists to develop a financial and capital markets. And we believe there is no other way to do this without sustainable development. That's why we invest a lot of time uh, building connections, participating boardings, and making partnership uh, with big, big institutions such as Global Compact, PRI, Sustainable Stock Exchange, of course, WFE, uh, GRI, CDP. So we believe that uh, together we are stronger. And this is a, a strategic, strategic driver for us to act together to tackle this big challenge, which is sustainability and sustainable, sustainable development goals. Uh, next slide, please. Here we can see a reflection that we did some time ago uh, about transparency and investors. We, we know that investors need ESD information to make a well-founded decision, a complete decision. Without this information, investors end up following the, the traditional portfolio location model, which prioritizes, we know, economic performance. And what happened? Uh, companies and sustainability experts like us complain that investors pay insufficient attention to ESD disclosure. So how can we break this bad cycle uh, with the transparency, transparency of ESD issue information? That, we, uh, that why we, we say all the time, transparency is the name of the game. And that's why also we have been developing uh, through these years a lot of initi some initiatives 
regarding sustainability, regarding transparency, sorry, uh, such as reporter explain for sustainability or integrated report, reporting that we launched in, in 2012 at Rio Plus 20 here in Rio de Janeiro. Other initiative is that uh, all answers to the corporate sustainability index questionnaire in Brazil is open for everyone to see it in the, in the uh, ISC's website. Uh, ICO2 is other uh, index that we have, the, corp the carbon efficient index, and there is some, um, some items regarding transparency in these items also. And since uh, 2015, when UN launched the Sustainable Development Goals the, in, in the 2030 Agenda, of course, we, 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 we thought a lot how we can um, stimulate this agenda, how we can promote this agenda, motivate the listed companies in Brazil to adopt, to reflect about how the 2030 Agenda can impact their business, it can bring it uh, in a strategic way. Uh, so, in the next slide, please. That's why I launched this year a new reporter explain, a reporter explain for su the sustainable development goals, again in, part in partnership with GRI. Uh, basically, we asked to the companies to answer us if they they are elaborating the sustainability or integrated reporting, taking into account the SDGs. Um, we are very excited with the, the answer that I will explain uh, soon because we know this is a new, this is a new agenda and we need to, to talk a, a, a lot with the, the companies about it. But the results are, are quite good in our opinion. Um, 60 companies in Brazil said, yes, we are taking into account the SDGs in our reports. 87 said no. We are not, but uh, um, we are. Uh, we, we can explain why not. So, in the right side of this the, the slide, you see the explanations. Um, I would like to to point point out uh, some information. Said seven companies said no, but uh, they are already elaborating their reports, taking into account the SDGs. 36 are studying the possibility or intend to have their sustainability or integrate reports in this way. When you put together these numbers, we can uh, say that 23%, almost one quart quarter of listed companies in B3 are looking into the agenda in some way. So uh, this initiative uh, that we will repeat every year uh, show, us, uh, show us that it's uh, agenda that the companies are paying attention and we know our responsibility as the heart of the capital markets uh, and we think that if a uh, stock exchange assume its responsibility and create some initiatives regarding SDGs agenda certainly we are collaborating for the advance of this agenda in the world so um, this is my message for now uh, thank you for the opportunity again and looking forward for the question and answer session. Thanks very much, Sanya. That was, um, yeah, it was really interesting. Um, I'd be interested in see what the results are like next year if that um, proportion of companies increases from 23%. Um, yeah, that's great. Um, I'm going to pass it along to Siobhan now to talk about the um, World Federation of Exchanges and uh, her role in the SDGs. Thanks, Thanks Siobhan. Thanks, Erin. Um, thanks, everyone. If we can just move to, we can skip over the title slide, if you like. Um, so I'd just like to pause on this slide here and just to give people some context as, as to the World Federation of Exchanges and what we are. We're an industry association that represents um, stock exchanges. We have 66 members and those members represent um, over 200 stock exchanges spread around the world. You can see the spread on the map. Um, of those members, um, there are over 46,000 listed co companies listed on the markets represented by those members. And the combined market capitalization of those companies came close to 75 trillion US dollars as at um, June of this year. Um, if we add in WFE affiliates as well, who are exchanges, small frontier market exchanges who are not yet full members, but engage with the organization, 
um, we add a further 245 billion US dollars of market cap and a further 1500 listed companies. So the, the potential scope and reach of an organization like ours through our membership um, and the impact that we can have on corporate reporting is quite significant. If we move to the next slide. So the WFE has, um, has engaged formally and actively with sustainability since 2014, though informally since before then. Um, Sonia uh, knows I'm one of her biggest fans and B3 is one of the early leaders um, in the sustainability space amongst our membership. Um, the WFE established a sustainability working group in 2014. That working group um, has formal representation from a third of our membership on the working group. And one of the first things that that working group did was create um, sort of a model guidance for stock exchanges um, around ESG disclosure specifically. So for those exchanges who had not yet issued um, ESG guidance, uh, disclosure guidance in their markets, we wanted to create a starting point so that they didn't have to begin um, right from, from the start um, to encourage disclosure in their markets. So we created this guidance, it includes um, 33 KPIs, or key performance indicators, which appear most commonly across the multitude of reporting frameworks, and put that out, as I said, at the end of 2015. One of the other initial areas and ongoing areas of the WFE and its membership is looking at um, the sort of traditional role, as it were, of exchanges around mobilization of capital. Um, I think Rebecca will speak to the, the financing need um, to meet some of the sustainability challenges that we face. And markets are one mechanism to create a um, regulated, secure, um, price transparent um, mechanism for raising of capital. We now have seven WFE member exchanges that have dedicated green bond segments. And one of those exchanges is also um, has a a segment for social bonds and social impact bonds. The membership is now focused on having sort of completed this initial iteration of work, um, looking at updating the ESG guidance that we issued at the end of 2015 to include amongst other things, the SDGs specifically, and to think about how we incorporate the SDGs into the sort of guidance and reporting framework. Um, but one of the other discussions that we We'll begin to have within our membership is opportunities that we may have to use the SDGs as a lever for change beyond simply um, corporate reporting. So whilst the starting point amongst our membership is that, as Sonia mentioned, it is very important for investors to have a comprehensive set of information on which to make informed decisions, um, and that by definition includes ESG information, we also believe that um, we can use these types of opportunities to drive behavior change within corporations and particularly amongst our listed companies. So the SDGs with their specific focus on impact rather than simply behavior um, gives us an opportunity to begin conversations about what businesses are doing and the impact of their role. Um, and that will be the sort of next area that we begin to focus on. How do we what is appropriate and how do we begin to use the SDGs as a, an opportunity for a conversation about, about long-term sustainable change. Um, obviously, as, a, as entities that operate public markets, um, one of our primary concerns is ensuring that people continue to use public markets. And so there is always a balancing act for us around what is the information that we require our companies to disclose and um, the behavior that we expect from our companies relative to unlisted companies and um, to ensure that we, we continue to see public use of markets with the benefits that we think comes from that. Erin, um, I'll leave it there for now and then we can pick up any additional points later on. Thanks, Siobhan. Um, that was really comprehensive. I actually have a lot of questions for you as well um, when we come to the Q&A. Um, but I'm going to pass it along to Rebecca now to talk a little bit about this from a corporate standpoint. Rebecca, over to you. Thank you very much. And uh, moving on to the first slide, um, this shows um, HSBC's recent sustainable finance commitments. I'll speak a little about those and how they relate to the SDGs um, and then move on to an example of a bond. Um, I won't go the whole way through the slide, 
Um, but just to note, HSBC does have a strong commitment to sustainable finance and extensive credentials in this space. Uh, we've already begun working with our customers and clients to deliver the additional 2.4 trillion US dollars of investment that will be required annually uh, to achieve the SDGs. Um, and there's various publications, for example, the Earth Security Report 2017, uh, which we've supported the publication of. The first commitment that we have listed on this slide with the provision of 100 billion US dollars of financing and investments, um, some of that will be um, directly related to the Sustainable Development Goals um, and the achieving the Paris Agreement targets. Uh, moving on to the next slide, um, here we have a recent SDG bond framework and um, this shows the SDG bond framework which is public and it's on our website side by side with the green bond framework and HSBC issued a one billion dollar bond um, which was allocated to various sectors. There were seven of the SDG sectors where the use of proceeds from this bond issuance will be applied and uh, that was issued by HSBC Holdings and while we do have an indirect impact on several of the other SDGs, these are the SDGs where we're focusing our direct contribution upon and the use of proceeds for that bond um, will be allocated to those seven SDGs which are in the top right hand side. Um, and just to finish off, um, this, these type of structures, SDG bonds, um, also the reporting associated with the SDGs will help direct that private finance um, towards some of those impacts um, where this funding gap remains. And whilst it's clear that public financing will be used to achieve these UN goals, um, the SDG fund and government funding being a part, there is still, still a significant funding deficit and private finance is needed to support that gap. Um, so there are examples where companies are directing some of their activity towards SDGs. Um, for example, the way that we've issued this bond, all there's reporting in line with the SDGs um, and it helps direct towards those gaps. Um, so strongly encouraging a, of those sorts of areas, albeit it's quite early days at the moment. Um, and I'll finish off there, um, just leaving time for, for any more questions towards the end. Thank you, Erin. Thanks, Rebecca. That's really interesting. Um, yeah, I kind of like the idea that, you know, from a company perspective, you think that transparency is going to help with not just the, um, you know, consideration from a you know, meeting of... of um, framework and guidance perspective but also you know with getting that private financing happening um so we're gonna have i'm gonna do a little um piece as well on on sort of the technology side of things but before we get to that we actually have another poll that we want to do with participants um so i'm gonna um ask that people get involved with that now so this is like based on what you've heard and, and what your thoughts are do you feel that your company has the tools to effectively address and monitor SDG related risks and opportunities. Um, and I'll give you a minute to have a think about that. We've had some interesting input already, lots of considerations here. Um, you know, in the first poll, we had somebody come back talking about the fact that they're not a publicly traded company. So um, interesting perspective there on what the, um, you know, where the drivers are um, for those companies. Um, and we're getting quite a lot of results. Oh, different from last time. We close. We still have a um, sort of a higher proportion of companies with a no. Uh, not sure is interesting. I'd like to kind of understand from people what you know, potentially they're not sure about. If it's um, you know what what are the expectations possibly? Um, but you know, alongside with what B three said about the proportion of companies that are already looking at this, thirty percent saying yes. I think is a, a pretty good starting point for organizations. Um, okay, so that's great. Um, lots of food for thought there. Um, so I wanna just um, follow up on the points made by the other speakers by reinforcing the importance of transparency um, 
between companies and stakeholders like stock exchanges, like investors. It's important to recognize the increased demand companies are facing to account for non-financial impacts. Um, I say that the, the sustainable de development goals are an opportunity to focus attention on a common set of goals that bridge the gap between company risk, existing frameworks and stakeholder demand. Um, and I'll comment as well on how companies can enhance their own insights using technology in a, a data-driven approach. Um, so first of all, I just want to underline the evolution of, of various compliance drivers in the non-financial reporting space. From the earlier slide, we saw that, you know, there's a huge increase in, in demand and non-financial reporting and um, among other regulatory stakeholder groups, stock exchanges are an increasing part of that. Um, you know, the, the number of stock exchanges, not just sustainable stock exchanges, but, you know, world stock exchanges that are um, asking companies to comply with some kind of non-financial reporting has basically doubled in the last seven years. Um, so the field's really evolving. It's moving from a reactive point of view to a proactive standpoint for companies, which I guess requires companies to think about non-financial issues in the context of, of impact, risk and opportunity impact, and accounting for those in a public way is a large part of that. Um, so from, from Sonia Siobhan and Rebecca's point of view, we really heard why the issues are becoming mainstream and they have financial implications for companies, investors, and they have wider impacts on all types of social and environmental capital. So one of the things that we do at Data Moran is track how issues transition from the court of public opinion into the legal courtroom and into the boardroom and use that to see how companies are responding to public demand. The Task Force on Climate Related Disclosure, which Rebecca is very familiar with, as all our panelists are, is a really good example of how demand has evolved in non-financial reporting. This is a voluntary guidance, but it's heavily backed by stakeholders and that coupled with existing compliance mechanisms and a series of highly publicized controversies led by regulators and investors on climate disclosure and air emissions in the last two to three years, particularly for certain sectors, where the impacts are most prevalent, you can really see how the demand for transparency is impacting company disclosures. So if we move on to the next slide. Um, but the graph is really plotting the proportion of companies by sector and year that are including climate change related issues in annual performance reports. This is based on a database of 7,000 companies globally, the largest companies. Um, you can see there's a steady increase since 2010. Um, and this is current up to publications released in 2017. Um, and you'll see that there is a, a slight lag um, in the latest year, primarily because we, you know, we're not finished the year, we're rating for around 30% of reporting um, and a lot of that sustainability reports. But primarily I wanted to highlight how um, the utility sector and the oil and gas sector um, have reacted in the latest reporting year there's a demonstrable uptake in the number of companies in these two sectors. Um, and this increase in transparency is really driven by SEC filings and financial reports. Um, so the evolution discussion around climate change issues, it's a good and arguably the most high profile example of how non-financial issues are becoming an issue of impact and not just transparency. Um, and this is really where we see technology having a part to play in these issues, not just climate change, but also something like the sustainable development goals and the actionable issues that companies can prioritize within the SDGs. So technology can identify the shift between which overarching issue sectors are paying attention to with regards to the SDGs. We see at a topic level that issues can differ quite dramatically and not just across sectors, but also regions. And this makes sense when you're trying to contextualize the operating environment of an organization. You know, it's dependent on the goals of the business, its leaders, stakeholders, the regulatory, political and physical environment. Um, and this is all impacting, well, firstly, the risks that a company faces, but secondly, where a company can affect the most change. Um, and this is really why data Moran focuses on corporate narrative to quantify risk and opportunity in, in that space. So you drive a lot of meaningful content from stories companies tell um, and this is where you can create links between commonalities as well as key different differentiations um, in the company approach um, and just briefly like applied in practice in the next slide um, this is a highlight provided by one of our clients it's a us-based hedge fund culture capital the core remit of them is to make 
culture profitable, profitable. Jeff Berger and his team are using a quantitative approach to measuring risk and opportunity in corporate culture. And this incorporates company responsiveness to issues like the sustainable development goals. So hedge funds like culture capital need lots of data. And we're looking at how companies are proactively mitigating issues and capitalizing on opportunities, as well as how they're reacting to the stakeholder environment. Um, and this data-driven approach requires both volume of information to monitor what's happening and details. What are companies doing? And this is where a technology approach wins. So using a natural language processing machine learning, we can scan multiple data types, reports, news, regulations, social media for thousands of references to non-financial issues and categorize these into qualitative insights, both at a framework and conceptual level, which allows you to monitor trends in corporate reporting behavior, but also at a more detailed topic level, just closing that gap between reporting and, and metrics. Um, you know, which I think is where this is leading is, you know, information is a, a big piece of, of the puzzle. Um, so I, you know, I'd like to, to move on to some questions now for our panelists. Um, I can see actually quite a lot of questions have come in already, which is great. Um, uh, in particularly around guidance and tools and um, lining up the various guidances and tools, I think. And I think I'd like to start with you, Siobhan, if that's possible. Um, we had a question come in saying, um, you know, what role is the WFE playing to encourage some degree of consolidation of guidelines and frameworks so companies can report and disclose in a consistent way? Is that a, a priority for you guys? So, so I don't know if it's a priority simply because um, we we obviously don't have the ability to to consolidate frameworks ourselves but but it is actually an area we've been working with um, some of the big standard setting organizations on because we recognize that it is challenging for corporate reporters who have to deal not just with a multiplicity of reporting frameworks but also have to deal with um, various ratings agencies, index um, providers, etc. So we've actually begun a conversation with one of the one of the largest um, standard setters. Um, and together with them, we are have, we are going around to various um, ratings agencies, index providers, and other standard setters around how do we start to consolidate in the space or at least more closely align. Um, the reporting requirements in the space. I, I want to add though, and, and I'd be interested on, in the perspective of other people on this call, that, that I think we also need to be realistic because I think the nature of the, the types of things we're reporting on means that this is not something where we're going to get to a sort of static set of requirements like we have in financial reporting. And, and even that's not static. I think the, the nature of the issues changes over time, the materiality of issues changes over time as the environment changes. So, so I think to a certain extent, these things are, are always going to be in a state of flux. And, and I think there are also regional disparities that we need to take cognizance of. You know, things that are material in one jurisdiction may not be material in another. And um, so I think where we can aim for standardization is around, around core metrics in relation to global issues like um, you know, carbon emissions and things like that. Um, but in some of the other areas, yes, working with people to see where we can drive consolidation and standardization, um, but also cognizant that we, that we may not get to a, an IFRS for ESG. Okay, fantastic. Um... Do you to see um, the companies, or sorry, the exchanges in your listing, your members, kind of moving in that direction of, of building this kind of guidance and stuff? You mentioned before that you have seven um, members with dedicated green bonds. Do you see this increasing? Do you see exchanges moving in that direction? Sorry, you mean in terms of providing more financing, sort of dedicated financing platforms? Dedicated financing platforms and also, um, I think, setting an expectation, like um, kind of stating that this is what they're interested in and, um, you know, looking for in terms of companies. Yeah, I mean, 
I think that's a longer term. Uh, so, so setting expectations, I think, is a, a longer term conversation, in part because one needs to be cognizant of the, the mandate of the exchange specifically. But one of the things, I mean, exchanges have soft power, and, um, and Sonia can speak to this. I mean, B3 have done amazing things in Brazil. Um, exchanges have soft power in terms of being able to con convene conversations between issuers and investors um, about expectations, stakeholder expectations, narrowly and broadly defined. And, um, and I think that that's likely where, where that conversation will take place. What we have seen in the disclosure space is we've got, I think, something like, um, I, can't, I didn't look at the latest numbers, but something like 35 exchanges um, already um, sort of having issued ESG guidance, disclosure guidance in their markets. Um, some of that is mandatory disclosure, um, and more exchanges have committed to issuing guidance um, by the end of this year, which means they are running out of time. Okay, interesting. I might then um, come to you, Sonia. Um, you know, uh, Siobhan's kind of uh, referenced, you know, how you guys are really taking a leadership role in this space. Um, what is it for you? What are the incentives for B3? Um, not just in terms of getting involved in the SDGs early on, but also you talked about other frameworks and coupling with them, and you said together we're stronger. Um, you know, how does that play out for you? Yeah, uh, what we try to do is to uh, combine different tools and different strategies to, to involve the companies. Because you know, we have uh, different stages. Uh, one company maybe is more advanced than one than another one. And so, uh, what we basically try to do, for example, we have a, a, a line with uh, education uh, actions, with workshops, with guides, such as Shoban mentioned. Um, we promote a lot of uh, networks to to share the dilemmas because this, this journey is, is full of dilemmas. So there is a, a part of uh, education. Um, also, we try to put into the business, of course, because uh, we need to put uh, in the, the, the mainstream. So the indexes are, are so stronger to, to do this, so strong to do this. The corporate sustainability index, the, the corporate governance index, the carbon efficient index, and also we are, um, looking at the green bonds market. So we put the, the agenda into the products and services. Um, other part of it is the influence. As uh, Shoban said, the soft power. Uh, we, we understand again, I said in my presentation, we understand that our, our responsibility. So all the time we are interacting with investors, with analysts and with companies, and we, we do the bridge between these stakeholders because we are in the middle, we, we are in the heart of the capital markets and we deal with all these stakeholders. So this is a very unique position to, to stimulate the advance of the agenda and consequently uh, the, the, the advance of the practice into the listed companies. So we, for example, we have an, an uh, initiative investor briefing that we invite the companies come to, to the B3 to present their, their, their actions, their practice, their agenda to the investors and analysts. So in summary, Erin, um, what we try to do is to have a, a, a puzzle of uh, uh, initiatives that is like a complementary education, products and services, network, influence, and, and sometimes, of course, we launch uh, uh, some recommendation in a more uh, objective way, such as re uh, reporter explain. So it's a recommendation, and when the uh, recommendation comes from an exchange, uh, of course, the listed companies probably pay attention to it. Okay, interesting. I want to ask you a follow up as well, Sonia, about that. Um, given that you have that kind of unique position between corporates and investors, um, for for either or both of those sides, have you seen any kind of clear barriers that companies might face or investors might face in in terms of engaging with the SDGs? Um, I think the, the 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 principal point is because it's a new agenda. So I think we are in a, in a moment that we need to, to invest in, in information. 
what are you talking about in the end of the day? So um, I, I think the, the first challenge is to understand uh, because uh, we have so many information, so many guidelines, frameworks, and so on. And suddenly, uh, UN launched, not suddenly, but UN launched a big thing such as uh, uh, sustainable development goals. So um, um, the, the moment is to, to, to uh, invest in more information, uh, clarify what are you talking about, and maybe this is the challenge. And then, of course, it's how uh, we put this agenda that maybe can appear abstract or inspirational and so on, but how, how the companies and investors can put in practice this agenda into their business. This is the second challenge. So first, I think, is to understand. And then, how can I do the, the correlation, the link between my business and the SDGs. And then uh, probably the, the, the journey will be easier when uh, we pass these two stages. Okay, fantastic. Thanks, Sonia. Um, which means I'm going to go over to you now, Rebecca, because um, we've had a lot of um, questions come in around frameworks, guidelines. Um, I know there are a lot of those that are available out there um, for people to kind of use. Um, the, you know, the, the UNGC released its framework as well for mapping the SDGs to business issues. Um, but you come at it from both an investor perspective, but also as a company yourself. Um, what, like, what is your starting point, either as a company or an investor, for looking at these issues? Yeah, so just to talk uh, a little from a, from a company perspective, um, and also um, respond to the, the lack of consistency and the, the sheer number of frameworks, that's certainly something I feel quite personally, um, because we're now nearly into triple figures in terms of the number of ESG or non-financial reporting frameworks which cover HSBC somewhere, um, either at the group level or at a subsidiary level. There are vast, vast numbers of them. Um, I think the way that, that I would approach, approach it is um, firstly, ESG or, or the SDGs, it shouldn't become a tick box exercise. Um, materiality is really important, and I certainly agree about the evolution. Some of these topics will evolve over time. So I think it's worth considering what are the hygiene factors? What are the things which you simply have to do to remain in business um, or, and the operations as well? So that could be around governance. It could be... Um, around some other criteria, so the must do versus the activities where um, your company may have a particular impact or wishes to make a particular impact um, and can really drive and lead change. And so I really think about it in those two ways. Um, and I think they are quite different. I think for some of the, the frameworks on the, the more operational side or the, the sort of must do side, um, from an HSBC point of view, I think TCFD would be one of those. Um, I think picking an ESG framework is, is a good way to proceed, or at least having a, an internal assessment of materiality. Um, and then thinking about those impact activities, it's probably a case of looking at um, your own business activities, the balance sheet lending in the case for a bank, and those particular areas where you can really make a difference. Um, and sort of pushing hard rather than trying to boil the ocean and do absolutely everything. Um, I also think from a materiality point of view, if you start with your customers and your employees, that probably gives you a pretty good view of your business. So if you think about the SDGs and how it maps to either your, your customers or your employees or both, um, I think that's a pretty good starting point rather than than, as I said earlier, trying to do um, absolutely everything. Um, thinking about the reporting, which is an output, um, that um, will drive potentially some investment decisions um, by asset managers if the, the reporting is there. Um, and again, if the reporting is there along the lines of the various SDGs, those where a company has decided to make an impact, um, that becomes quite insightful from an asset management point of view. Um, but I, I do think it will develop and it will grow over time and different companies will respond in, in different ways. And in some ways, the, the more data and the more reporting that happens in this early stage, 
um, the better. And it, I think we'll see over time a convalescing around um, the middle or what the market thinks um, looks good or what the market thinks is, is appropriate or useful information. And that could be slightly different for different sectors. Um, but I do think at the moment we are at quite an early stage. Um, so in sort of encourage getting started, thinking about activities um, and those where you really want to, to make an impact. Awesome. Thanks, Rebecca. Yeah, I totally get your point about the number of frameworks and guidances being sort of overwhelming. We kind of look at um, regulation, soft and hard law at a global level here and, and for ESG issues, non-financial issues, we're tracking more than 4,000 initiatives at this point. And that's just a huge number of compliance, you know, requirements um, for people to be... To to think about and then you have slightly different nuances in terms of what the expectation is and that's for you know like the government but for you know other regulators market regulators um, investors um, those kinds of people as well so I like the idea of picking an ESG framework to to start with um, and reporting on you know something as well because um, you touched on this as well Siobhan I want to come back to you about this in terms of like the availability of data sets and um, Ask you a slightly cheeky question, but is any data good? Um, is, is any data good? As in, is any data good and therefore we should just take any data we can get? Or is there any good data out there? Um, I think, you know, is there any good data out there? What is, you know, what is the best approach that you've seen? Yeah, I, so, I, I mean, I'd actually like to pick up on a point that Rebecca made, because I think it's a really important point, and it's sometimes overlooked, and perhaps in part because of the overwhelming nature of um, the reporting frameworks, but, but I think we sometimes get too hung up on the reporting and forget that the, the reporting is the, is the end point of what is being done within the organization. And I, you know, sometimes make the argument that Part, part of the reason we may see poor quality reporting is because, because there isn't good thinking within the organization to give substance to the reporting. So, so I think it's really important um, to, to take Rebecca's point that, that organizations begin to think about um, which of these issues are relevant for, for them. Um, I think SASB has done a great job in terms of creating a so fairly extensive materiality map which should give organizations at least a starting point of thinking about what are the issues that might be material to their industry or sector. Um, and then obviously they need to apply their own thinking and logic to it. And um, GRI has done a mapping together with, um, I think it's UN Global Compact, where they look at the GRI indicators and which of those map to the SDGs specifically. Um, so for those companies that are already reporting against GRI, that would be a useful reference point. Um, but then, but then really seeing the reporting as an output and recognizing again to pick up to emphasize a point that Rebecca made that um, and I think it was someone from HSBC who, who told us this in the context of reporting um, perfect is the enemy of the good and we're not we're not at a perfect state in terms of reporting frameworks or understanding or any of these issues yet but we need to get started because the sooner we get started the sooner we can work out what's not good data and what is good data so, so those would be my comments. And I think there are some companies that are doing very good reporting, um, but, but I think we're at the beginning of this journey and we need to just keep going. Okay, thanks, that's really good. I'm gonna, I wanna come back to you, Rebecca. There's been some like kind of questions directed to you about um, HSBC sustainable, sustainable financing approach. Um, uh, and I think in the context of the SDGs, what represents kind of um, opportunities and innovation to you? Uh, we particularly had, you know, some questions around different types of technology, blockchain, cryptocurrencies, those kinds of things. Um, do you, can you comment on what you kind of, from an SDG perspective, what are some like clear opportunities for investment at a company level? Um, sure. So... Um, just to reference some of the sectors that, that we uh, have use of proceeds for in, in the SDG bond we issued, um, that was good health and well-being, quality education, clean water and sanitation, affordable and clean energy, industry, innovation and infrastructure, and sustainable cities and communities and climate action. 
Those are the SDGs, um, seven of them, where the use of proceeds for this bond uh, will be allocated. And within those SDGs, there are certainly areas um, which will require innovation, um, or there are quite innovative companies using um, potentially fintech, which I think you mentioned, um, or other parts of technology. Um, so, for example, um, electric vehicles potentially could be um, a part, certainly, of a green bond. So, I think there are some of those opportunities for innovation. And I think one one thing just to bear in mind is again not to with reporting not to restrict ourselves too much on um, broadly with some of these frameworks being too prescriptive because some of this innovation might fall out of some of these frameworks um, so therefore there could be um, outside a bond framework an additional need for bank financing um, i think there's there's lots and lots of examples and it, it does depend a little bit on the sector um, so uh, the other piece would be also thinking about sustainability and for a bank's operations, how that innovation feeds in there too. Um, so I think there's innovation, particularly probably around climate right now, but also some of those other sectors, um, that there is a need for private finance in some of those innovative areas. And then I think beyond that is thinking about how some of that innovation can also work in your own company too. Um, particularly um, for banking, there are fintech solutions and um, sort of various areas which will um, ultimately um, speed up banks and also make them more sustainable because of uh, reduced waste. So I think, I think there's quite a few different areas that innovation can cover, both from our customers' point of view and also from uh, um, an operational point of view. Okay, thanks, Rebecca. That's great. I think, um, you know, kind of generally, because we're early stages of the SDGs, you know, there's a kind of a sense that, um, you know, for companies, first of all, deciding to get on board with it is like a big step. And then, you know, in terms of frameworks and things like that, like picking a direction and, and you know, at least starting in that direction is a, a good way to go. And then it's a bit of trial and error and using, you know, other good examples of, of companies or frameworks that, you know, that work because, um, you know, each company is unique, um, you know, and that's where we'll get to in terms of bringing this into a, a holistic um, accounting standard, possibly at one point, <laughs> far in the future. Yeah, um, I think it, just to add that, probably in terms of being practical and thinking about reporting, um, when we started and embarked on um, integrating sustainability more deeply in the reporting piece, um, just in a practical way, starting the internal meetings by getting a small group of people together who are probably reasonably senior in the organisation, but include the business, uh, I think certainly HR, company secretary, um, finance and risk. I think getting that, that small group of people together just to talk about what does, what does ESG mean to us, what are our material areas or what SDGs do we want to focus on? Um, and just doing it in quite a simple way, even putting things to the vote um, can be quite interesting. And it starts that internal conversation. Um, and I do agree, rather than being led by the reporting requirement, it's some of those internal, very simple internal structures and meetings, which don't have to be terribly um, frequent, but actually bear a lot of fruitful results um, because that, that drives what reporting and what externally um, you're going to be talking about. Okay, fantastic. Um, well, that's been really good. I, um, we're actually going to do our final poll now, I think, taking into consideration all those questions and, and comments. Um, and the poll is, um, should stock exchanges require non-financial reporting as a listing rule? Uh, I think that, um, so, Siobhan, Sonia, you'll be very interested in, in the results of this one, and Rebecca, of course. Um, so if everybody can submit their responses, uh, we're getting a pretty high rate of response. A lot of yeses so far, that's interesting. Um, Cause we have had a lot of questions about guidance and frameworks. I think um, anything that you know, gives you a clear idea of a, a framework to follow is, is maybe a good incentive for people at this point. Um, and nearly finishing the poll, uh, we have an almost overwhelming response of yes, 94% of people think that stock exchanges 
should require non-finance reporting as a listing rule. And some people are unsure. I guess, yeah, I guess there's some consequences there as well that, um, you know, could, could occur. Um, I, I think we've got um, just a couple minutes to kind of wrap up here. And, you know, it's been a good discussion. I'd like to go further, but I also, you know, think people have got things to get on with as well. But um, Sonia, Siobhan, Rebecca, it's been a really great discussion. We really appreciated hearing from you. Um, thanks for joining us today to everybody on the webinar. Um, there's a couple of key highlights I think have come from the discussion. Um, perhaps maybe too many, but um, you know, a couple of that we noted from our conversations with the panelists is that, you know, that sustainable stock exchanges are seeking long-term value and the SDGs are a valuable part of that process. Um, continuous monitoring is key um, in terms of, of building a repository of, of, of information that helps support, you know, the company, stakeholders, investors, lots of different people. Um, and from our point of view, I think we think that qualitative data really does help to close the information gap. So the more people can, are happy to share their stories, um, you know, the better off we'll all be in terms of learning from each other. Um, and getting you know, the best out of the sustainable development goals. Um, we're definitely gonna share the webinar afterwards. Um, so everybody will have that. If there's any like particular questions, we're happy to follow up on those as well. Um, it's definitely this conversation will continue and we invite you all to continue talking to us about it and to, to all the panelists. Um, so if you have any specific questions, you can get in touch. Um, there's some details provided here. You can reach out directly to me. Uh, at eerie value, Aaron at eerie value .com. Um, Yeah, and, and I think that's it. I hope everybody enjoys the rest of their day. Thanks again to the panelists and uh, yeah, reach out, definitely. Thanks very much, everybody. <laughs>